Um, ladies and gentlemen, continuing on with uh, with our day, we have uh, our next speaker is someone who spends a lot of time uh, looking at food, uh, but not in the traditional way of, say, the way that Dahlia and Tabitha do, but in how food is labeled and how it's packaged and, and uh, what that means, in particular with children. Uh, her name is Dr. Charlene Elliott. She is another one of our U of C contingent here. And uh, she's an associate professor in, the, uh, in communications, a joint appointment between kinesiology and uh, arts. And her focus is on how we package and how we label, how we communicate food and its value and its nutrition, et cetera. Um, and uh, one of those people that you sort of think, after hearing her, you go, God, I feel terrible for just eating what I just ate. But um, I think she'll uh, give us some grace with some of the mashed potatoes here today. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Charlene Elliott. I have my little speech prepared only to keep myself a little bit um, shorter because as an academic I actually find it hard to introduce myself in under 5 to 10 to 15 minutes. Um, the more degrees I get, the longer it takes to introduce. Is that okay for sound? Okay. Um, so I would have to go after the international um, rock, paper, and scissors guy. Um, so this is slightly intimidating. But I'd like to thank um, the Chamber of Commerce to begin with for inviting me to be part of Project IF. It's a real honor to be here and I've learned an awful lot um, this morning and also in the beginning of the afternoon. So I'm a communication scholar that works in the area of obesity and public health um, with a specific focus on food marketing to children, um, food labeling, policy, and, and again looking particularly on um, food marketing. And it's interesting because food marketing to children currently is a multi-billion dollar industry and it's a hugely contested one given the obesity epidemic. Right now, roughly 26% of Canadian children are overweight or obese and it's a problem that's pulled the uh, um, food marketing industry and its marketing practices into the spotlight. So food marketing is routinely critiqued for creating an obesogenic or a toxic food environment. And that's an environment in which food is um, symbolically overvalued and always available. So one of the interesting parts um, and a question that I want to ask for today is what if we asked completely different questions about food, particularly when it comes to marketing to children? So let me explain. Um, the current policy initiatives and approaches to food marketing to children right now, um, in terms of dealing with the childhood obesity epidemic, it all concentrate on the nutrient profiling of the foods. So the World Health Organization, um, the recent Uni United Nations High Level Summit on um, the Prevention of Non-Communicable Diseases, which happened in September, um, the Ministers of Health recent document on curbing childhood obesity, all focus on reducing the marketing of high um, sugar, high fat, high sodium foods to children. In Canada, it's interesting because the food industry has come and created its own set of criteria to try and prevent regulation from, by government. And that's with the Children's Food and Beverage Advertising Initiative, which started in 2007, in which members of the food industry all created their own criteria of what constitutes a healthier for you choice um, that is going to be advertised to children. Now, it's kind of interesting because under this rubric, oops, I want to go back. Um, under the Children's Food and Beverage Advertising Initiative, a healthy dietary choice actually includes Fruit Loops, Lucky Charms, Reese's Puff Cereal, Dunkaroos, and Kool-Aid Jammers. Um, so it's kind of interesting how the nutrient profiling model allows particular things to happen. The other part that I want to point out about this criteria is that um, under the CFDAI, Kool-Aid Jammers is actually a healthier for you choice to children, but Kool-Aid does not constitute a healthier for you choice. And as far as I can figure it out, it's because Kool-Aid Jammers um, are like those little Tetra Packs. They come in 180 milliliter serving sizes, whereas Kool-Aid is mixed up to 250 milliliters. And so the sugar content is high enough that it gets above the nutrient profiling criteria. Um, and it's a little bit of a problem um, in terms of how to actually uh, make the healthy choice the easier choice for children. The other part that I think is kind of interesting about the Children's Food and Beverage Advertising Initiative, where you actually create criteria around what constitutes a healthy for you choice, is it kind of misses the whole point of how advertising works. Advertising works to raise brand awareness of particular things. So for example, 
you know, it seems somewhat ridiculous to expect children to go to their parents and say, Mom, I want you to buy me Kool-Aid jammers, but not Kool-Aid when you go to the grocery store. They're not going to parse out that kind of criteria. Um, there's little meaningful difference for children between the two. And more importantly, if you stop and think about the way they classify food forms generally, there's no reason why children should say, oh, Dunkaroos are a healthier choice, but um, Chips Ahoy are not a healthy choice, which actually don't make the cutoff for the um, healthier breed choice or healthy dietary choices under this rubric. The other part that I think is kind of interesting about this whole nutrient profiling model is it misses the ethical point um, in terms of advertising to children. In Canada, in Quebec, since 1980, there has been actually a ban on all advertising to children under the age of 12. And the logic, um, this ban's been in place since 1980. It was challenged in the Supreme Court once by Irwin Toy, who actually wanted to market to children and argued that um, the ban on marketing to children was a, um, an affront to their freedom of expression. And the ban was um, upheld by the Supreme Court because they argued that uh, children were not cognitively, cognitively aware that they were being marketed to. So it was per se unethical to market to children because they didn't actually, very young children, those aged six and seven, didn't know that they were being marketed to. Um, so what I think is kind of interesting around this is that the ethical component of marketing to food to children tends to be um, sidestepped when it comes to food marketing because under the nutrient profiling criteria, it's like, well, if it's a healthier for you choice, it's okay to market to it. And I think this kind of miss point, misses the point because either it's either ethical to market to children or it's not. Um, it's not more ethical to, diet, to market diet Coke to children because it won't make them fat and then unethical to market Coke because it will. And that's the kind of logic that seems to be playing out in terms of the, the food policy and food marketing. So what I wanted to ask is what if we stopped focusing on the nutrient profile of foods and actually ask completely different questions about food when it comes to children's health? And the question would be, what does it mean to market foods to children in a particular way? I've spent the last um, six or seven years heading up a series of research projects focused on the marketing of foods to children, specifically in the supermarket. And it's interesting because when people think of children's food in the supermarket, they tend to think of the cereal aisle. Um, although, over the last 10 years, there's been this huge process of what I call deserialization. The types of foods that you used to see in the cereal aisle have actually proliferated throughout the store. So there's hundreds of child-targeted products that you can find in the supermarket. Um, you've got things like the Quaker kids' oatmeal cookies and cream. Um, fruit gushers is another typical one. But one of the interesting parts uh, we, so we did a research study where we went in and we pulled all of the child-oriented products off the shelves and we coded them in terms of their marketing appeal, um, their nutrient profile, um, but the kind of things that made the, the foods attractive to children. One of the most noticeable things that um, came out is that kids' food is marketed as fun to children. And I mean, the fun is actually in, in not only the um, types of packaging and, and the cartoons that you find on the front of the boxes, but literally infused into the names themselves. So you've got fun cheese, which is shaped into, you know, fun shapes of little dinosaurs or moons and planets. Um, fun bite sun ripe fruit snacks, which all have neat shapes. Um, this one was a lot of fun because they had fun picks. Waffles were actually, um, they tattoo the waffle with images of the latest and greatest uh, movie that's you know, of interest to children. So um, there was Hannah Montana. Um, while the high school musical Star Trek also had fun picks. Um, this one I picked up yesterday at the supermarket, and this is um, the food uh, Yoplait Yo tubes, which is the glow-in-the-dark yogurt tube. Um, the earlier variant of these actually instructed children on the back of the box to take the yogurt tubes, hold them up to the light, and go into a dark place and watch the tubes glow. And I think that this is really interesting in terms of the ways that children's food is defined in opposition to adult food. And I mean, the opposition is that children's food is premised on its fun, that it comes shaped into neat stars and castles and it, it magically glows in the dark, that you play with it or you engage with it in a certain way. Um, so for example, you've got things like um, Betty Crocker tongue talk tattoo fruit roll-ups, which you actually can unroll the fruit roll-up and you tattoo your tongue with it. This is an interesting variant because these are the double dare tattoo, um, tongue talk tattoo fruit roll-ups and they come with actual dares on them. So if you lick the, um, the, the fruit roll-up, 
the dare magically appears. And it comes up with really helpful dares like, you know, do your homework with mustard, talk like a parrot all day, um, you know, instructions on how to actually act ridiculous. Um, now, why do I think that this is interesting? I think this is really interesting because the primary emphasis in terms of children's food marketing is actually about the entertaining aspects of the food. That food is about play, food is about entertainment, food is about sport. And the question, what does it mean to market foods in a, a particular way, is important because I kind of, you know, you stop and you think about, um, well, as a populist example, the relationships with food that that kind of marketing is encouraging. What I'm trying to say is if you think about behavior modification programs for obese adults, Weight Watchers would be your populist example. What they underscore is that particular relationships with food work to create overweight and obesity in adults. You're not supposed to eat for fun. You're not supposed to eat when you're bored. You're not supposed to eat for distraction. Um, Brian Weinzink uh, holds um, heads up a food research lab at Cornell University called the Food and Brand Lab. And the entire lab is about documenting, documenting the relationships between distracted eating or eater, eating for entertainment and obesity. So there's a lot of scholarly research um, upholding the relationship between eating for fun or entertainment and sport. But if you look at children's food marketing, the whole message is that food is fun, food is sport, food is entertainment. So I find it really interesting that actually from a very young age, we're treating, teaching children to actually develop a relationship with food that's inherently problematic, right? That you're eating for entertainment, even though we know that for adults, those exact same relationships work to create um, overweight and obesity in adults. So that's a really interesting um, and I think kind of troubling question. Um, the other part that I wanted to say about this fun part um, is once we started actually uh, publishing some of the papers on food marketing to children, um, it's a, of a lot of interest to journalists because uh, you know, everybody eats and everybody shops, and so there's a, there's a lot of appeal. So I get asked quite frequently, uh, apparently now I'm the food police, um, but what's wrong with food being fun? You know, like that somehow you're a killjoy because you're, you're criticizing food being fun. And I think this is a really interesting question because it's only very recently that we actually started evaluating food in light of its fun factor. Like maybe, you know, we evaluate food for its taste profile or aesthetically it should be appealing, but the idea of approaching food for its ability to entertain us is incredibly recent. You know, I never remember sitting down as a child and looking at, you know, my plate of food and saying, oh, mom, I can't possibly eat this cob of corn. Like, it's not the least bit fun, right? And yet, this is the kind of thing that's coming out right now. Um, so instead of um, asking this, like, I mean, it's, I think it's a very bizarre means that we've got to in terms of evaluating our foods. Um, so instead of actually presuming what this means, we actually headed up a second research project where we went and in interviewed children in focus groups across Canada to actually find out how do you evaluate food packaging? What does the labeling mean to you? What's your kind of um, sense of, of packaged foods? And one of the questions that we asked was, and I mean, it seems sort of like a very straightforward question, but you know, kids, and it was children um, grades one to six who were divided according to age, and gender, so grades one to two, three to four, five to six, and we asked them, what is kids' food? And when I was developing the moderator's guide, I ran this by um, a number of experts in children in terms of focus group methodology, and I said, you can't ask them that question. It's a total waste of your time. They won't know what you're talking about. And um, I said, I actually don't care. I just I want to know what they're going to say. And it's like, yeah, but it's kind of a throwaway question. The interesting thing is I am so glad that we did ask them because the kids knew exactly what we talked about, were talking about. And across the board, without exception, the answers were kids' food is junk food and it's sugar and it's sugary cereals um, so it, and, and it's candy. So it's junk food, sugar, candy. And it's like, oh, okay, that's interesting. Then what is adult food? And the top three answers, well, that's easy. Adult food is vegetables, salad, and meat. And I find it really interesting that the children's responses were so much about the fact that um, this low nutrient, um, highly calorific uh, sort of junk food, they identified as foods uniquely for them. And the foods that they identified for others were precisely the fruits, vegetables, and, and meats, the unprocessed products that Canada's Food Guide says that everybody should eat more of. And so what does it mean to actually have a whole generation of children who when asked, gee, what's kids' food? Um, think that it's junk food and think 
food for others is the kind of foods that they should be eating more of. Um, and so I, I think that is kind of an interesting question. The other part that we went on to ask them was how do you interpret food packages? Um, so we, we wanted to know what they looked for on a box to know whether it's a healthy food or not. And the answers were really revealing because children are intelligent and they're quite savvy, but they're not given the tools to actually evaluate um, foods for health. So it was like, oh, well, we know. If there's green on the box, you know it's a healthy food. Or if the box looks serious, you know it's a healthy food. Um, honeycomb cereal was routinely chosen as a healthy food because we gave them a whole bunch of boxes to choose from. It's like, really? Why is that? Oh, because it's brown. And that's what made it a healthy food. Um, and then the last part that I thought was really interesting is we, all, we had seven cereal boxes which they chose from. And they routinely said that white cereal was the healthiest choice of them all. And it's like, well, why? It's like, well, because there's, it was the only box that had a bowl with cereal in it and little slices of fruit. And it's like, because there's fruit on the box. And it's like, okay, so you pick the one thing that's not in the box that makes it a healthy for you choice. Um, and you know, it's interesting because they are uh, intelligent choices or ex explanations, they, they're flatly wrong. Um, but then you stop and you look at the slides that I started at the beginning of the talk where all of a sudden Kool-Aid jammers and Dunkaroos are a healthy dietary choice according to the food industry. How on earth are they supposed to be coming up with answers that are any different um, than the ones that they're actually coming up with? Um, and then the other part that I just wanted to talk about is how food marketing and, and the food and other trends in culture actually reinforce this. How many people are familiar with um, this, the, these two best-selling cookbooks, Deceptively Delicious and The Sneaky Chef? Okay, so this is the epitome of what's going on in food marketing right now to children, which is self-help. Children can't possibly eat fruits and vegetables on purpose. What you do is you puree them and you sneak them into brownies, you know, so that they're actually getting that by accident. So you see this also in packaged food products like KD Smart, where they've got um, powdered cauliflower, which has been, you know, added into the craft Dinner. Um, the Wonder Bread campaign, where it's white bread, but really it's whole wheat bread, but it looks like white bread, and it tastes like white bread, but it's got the goodness of whole wheat that kind of thing. The idea is to actually sneak in fruits and vegetables. Um, and I guess the question that I have beyond be, um, arising from that, especially given the children's answers to the focus groups, is it's like, you know what? Kids' food is junk food and adult food is fruits and vegetables and meat, is that why are we creating a condition in, or in, in our society where actually vegetables are um, seen as inherently distasteful, something you could never eat on purpose but only by accident, you know, and, and therefore have to be snuck into our foods. Um, I think this is a very troubling thing, and I think it's something that definitely needs to be questioned. I have two if takeaway questions that I would like to leave you with. Um, and one of them is a small if one question that is inspired by Michael Pollan's work on defense of food. And what I think is really interesting about that is those who have read it will know this, you know, um, sort of standard mantra, which is eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And it gets away from the troubling aspect of food marketing. One of the biggest things that's coming out right now is the ways in which um, foods that you presume are not healthy choices, like cookies and Dunkaroos and, and, and products that are marketed with, as breakfast candy, you know, complete with mini marshmallows in them, suddenly become healthy for you because they're an excellent source of vitamin D. Right? And his takeaway point was actually um, to try and avoid anything with a nutrition claim on it. And the reason that you avoid that is because you actually never see nutrition claims on products um, that you should be eating the most of. You never see a nutrition claim on a banana or broccoli, but you see tons of nutrition claims on things like marshmallow puzzles and Fruit Loops. Um, and the bigger uh, question, what if question, that I um, wanted to ask leave you with, and I know because we were supposed to spend some of this talk talking about ourselves and I wasn't so keen on that as a topic, um, was simply that when I finished my PhD and I started um, a tenure track job at a different institution, I was at the Christmas party with my colleagues and you can always tell the hardcore academics in the field because they're the ones who have had 52 drinks and they're talking about the future of the field. And so um, one of my colleagues had had 52 drinks and was talking about the future of the field of communication. And, and was going on and on about the fact that, you know, in communication studies, there's three types of questions. There's good questions, 
answers bad questions, and there was weird questions. And he turned to me and he said, and your questions, they're just weird. Um, and so my, my if question, the big if question, would be, what if, in fact, you took seriously your weird question? Um, because maybe sometimes the weird questions are sometimes the questions worth asking. So thank you very much.